We're really at an extraordinary moment in Australian history, and I really feel this. It's something that I didn't anticipate. It's something that took me by surprise, and I think it was something that was lying dormant in Australia for a very long time. People were looking for a way to have a hard discussion with each other about who we are as a people and what this country means as a nation. Sadly, it takes someone's pain often to open up a more general and much more deep and pervasive truth. In this case, it fell to Adam Goods, who of course had to endure what he had to endure last year. What Adam went through really formed the inspiration for me writing this book, Talking to My Country. I just want to read a little bit from the book to set up some of the discussion here today. Then in the winter of 2015, it started. A jeer in a corner of a stadium grew to a crescendo of booze. Week after week, Adam Goods faced this maddening chorus. What drove it? Some said they simply did not like him. To others, he was a cheat staging for free kicks. But there was something more sinister here. There was a line between Adam Goods and the 13-year-old girl and the ape taunt and this vocal lynching. Adam Goods had moved beyond his station. He was a blackfellow with a voice talking to a country that didn't like what it heard. Now the man who had scaled the heights of his game, who had won every accolade it had to offer, retreated broken. Australians could no longer look away from this mirror, from what this showed us. This was no longer a story of politics. This was a story we read in the grandstands and we could no longer ignore it. Some in the media tried to paint Adam as the villain. They twisted his words and accused him of humiliating the 13-year-old girl who had vilified him. He did no such thing. Australians manned the barricades, some generally and genuinely perplexed and saddened, others outraged that this country could even be accused of racism. He was accused of playing the victim, dealing the race card. Adam was told to toughen up, to get over it. We hear this a lot. History is in the past. Bad things happened, but it is time to move on. But history is not past for us. When Adam was going through what he was going through, and all of us, especially Indigenous people, and non-Indigenous people as well of goodwill were feeling the pain that he was going through and asking these questions. I decided to write an article for The Guardian Australia. And I wrote about not what lay in the head and the hearts of people who booed Adam Goods. I couldn't speak to that. I can't speak to that now, but I could speak to this. What did we hear when we heard those boos? because it was a sound very familiar to us. And what we heard was a howl of humiliation that echoed across 200 years of dispossession, scarred by the generations of injustice and suffering that followed. And I wrote that article more for my own benefit, more as a way of trying to wrestle with this myself and try to make sense of it to myself. Within a day, that article had been shared more than 100,000 times from the Guardian website, more than any article had been shared in one day on the Guardian website in Australia in its history. It had taken on a new life in social media. It was talked about on radio. People were talking about it in the streets. They spoke about it to me and people said this, is this truly who we are? Is this what we have arrived to? Is this the point in our history? For all that Australia is, for all that Australia has been able to create, the extraordinary achievements of this country, are we still divided by race? Do we still meet each other across this chasm of our history? Are we still so deaf and blind to the pain of Indigenous people that we don't know even when we're insulting them? 
And there is always a minority, a rump of Australia who want to cling on to old hatreds and old bigotries and old stereotypes about who we are as Aboriginal people and diminish our pain and diminish our history. But there is a far, far greater number of people who came to this with open hearts and open minds who genuinely wanted to find a way through. Not long after I was approached to write this book, it arose out of that article and they wanted me to be able to expand on the idea of what it is to be an Indigenous person in this country, to wrestle with our history, to live with the weight of that history. How do you as an individual navigate that course? How does a family hold on to a sense of itself when it is battered by that history? And I focused on what the Australian dream is. What is this dream of Australia? The dream that so many people buy into. The dream that draws people from Lebanon and Afghanistan and Pakistan and India and Greece and Ireland and Scotland and Finland and Canada and China and Vietnam and any of the countries you want to name that make up the population of this country. What is it? What is this beacon of hope that Australia represents to people? What is it that Australia has been able to create? The extraordinary things that Australia represents. A, a prosperous country. A country that is stable and secure. A country that is broadly tolerant, that has been able to integrate waves of migration, that has battled with itself, has battled with its history of the white Australia policy, has battled with itself, has a resilient democracy. What is it that is so great in this country and why is it that we suffer as Indigenous people still in this country? Why is it that a country that can have achieved all of these things can still have Indigenous people dying 10 years younger and being locked up in the numbers that we are locked up in our prisons? Why is it that we are six times more likely to go blind? Why is it that an Indigenous man between 25 and 30 is four times more likely to commit suicide? Why is it that we have three times the rate of depression as the rest of the country? That we die of illnesses that are long gone from the general population? How does this happen in a country as extraordinary as Australia? So I wrote this. They tell themselves this is a great country of good people. Here is how we, Indigenous people, see the Australian dream. Here is the worst of it. Aborigines rounded up and shot. Babies buried into the sand and decapitated. Women raped. Men killed as they hid in the forks of trees. Water holes poisoned, flour laced with arsenic. The Australian dream abandoned us to rot on government missions, tore apart families, condemned us to poverty. There was no place for us in this modern country and everything we have won has come from dissent. It has been torn from the reluctant grasp of a nation that for much of its history hoped we would disappear. We know this history, my people. This is a living thing. We touch it and we wear it. It is written in the scars on the bodies of men like my father. It is carried deep within us, mental wounds that cannot so easily heal. It is so close we can touch it. When I was a baby, my grandfather held me in his arms. He was the son of a man born into the frontier before the collection of colonies even became Australia. A frontier marked with violence, disease and death. From me to my grandfather to his father, that's how close it is. Being good and great does not absolve you from a terrible sin and a pain inflicted on a people who did nothing to deserve it. Remember that. The first people of this land who have suffered for your greatness did nothing to deserve it. A truly great country, if we truly believe it, should be held to great account. And that's the moment that we're at now. That's where people have come to. People who responded to a speech that I gave around the idea of the Australian dream released on Australia Day. It was watched more than one million times on the Ethics Centre 
website who hosted the event that I spoke at. And people have been saying to me, what can we do? How can we deal with this? What is the answer? We can't allow this to continue. Well, the answer begins with an acknowledgement of something that every single Indigenous person in this room and in this country knows. Something that we look for in each other. I can walk down the street of any town, any city, any outback town, in any part of Australia, and see it in the eyes of another Indigenous person. We walk past them in the street, and we see it where you don't. We catch each other's eye, and we know who we are, and we know the deep wound that sits within ourselves. It's what holds us together, and still what tears us apart. You cannot separate the dispossession and the suffering and the injustice and the poverty and the marginalisation that all Indigenous people, all Indigenous families have felt in their history. You cannot separate that from the malaise that sits at the heart of so many of the socio-economic issues and the policy issues that we see today and that you people in this room have to grapple with. And when people say, get over it, history is in the past, they don't know who we are and they don't know what we live with. I spent many years of my life living away from Australia as a correspondent for CNN. I covered wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and Pakistan. I covered the rise of China. I peered behind the secret world of South Korea. I was stood in the blood of terrorist attacks. I saw Protestant and Catholic tear each other apart in Northern Ireland. And I saw the weight of history in those countries. I saw how the great forces of history shape those lives. And it reminded me of how the great forces of history have shaped our lives as Indigenous people in this country. And how we can look at the war in Syria, the struggle in Afghanistan, or the rise in China. And we can see the forces of history. We can acknowledge what those countries have been through, and we still can't acknowledge what we've been through here in this country. I looked in those countries, in those stories, in those, in those faces. I looked for the stories of people who tried to live, live lives of meaning and dignity when all certainty had been removed. And when I looked into the eyes of a refugee in Afghanistan, the eyes of a peasant farmer in China looking for a foothold into the China dream, I saw the eyes of my family. I saw the eyes of my people. And I knew that we weren't alone because we were part of the great sweep of history as well. But we sit in this country as th fewer than 3% of the population, with no economic power, no power at the ballot box. And we sit here as we have always done at the mercy and the goodwill and the whim of Australia. And it has failed us time and time again. When our people have been asked to step up, we have stepped up. When we were locked on missions, we stepped up we held our families close. Our people went and picked fruit and chipped cotton and worked in sawmills as my father did. We did that to keep ourselves alive. When we were asked to step up and fight wars for this country, we did as my grandfather did. Not even a citizen of this country signed up to go and fight a war, a rat of Tobruk came back to this country where he couldn't even enter the pub to share a beer with the men that he'd fought alongside. They ask us to step up and we step up. And time and time again, we've been laid low by Australia. And when we raise these issues and we talk about the deep wound that sits within us, we are told that we are victims. Don't play the race card. Don't play the victim. I'm not here as a victim. My father who lost the tips of three fingers working in sawmills across New South Wales to put food on our table, was not a victim. My mother, who scrubbed floors to supplement the income that my father could bring in, was not a victim. 
My grandfather was far from a victim. So we suffer our history, and when we try to speak of our history, we are taunted and victimised for even wanting it recognised. So how do we move forward without an acknowledgement of the deep wound that sits within this country? And it is not just a wound that damages us, it damages Australia as well. If you can't reckon with your past, how can you possibly build a future? And it's a future that we all share. We share it in so many ways. We share it in the land that we live on. We share it in the work that we do. We share it when we attend schools together. We share it when we play football together. We even share it in our bloodlines. We're related to half of white Australia. <laughs> so, so it's a family thing. But we've got to be able to get past that and we've got to be able to talk about that. And there is a need for policy and we understand that. There is a need to be able to get the policy, the policy directives right. There is a need to be able to apportion the funding properly to get a result. The Australian taxpayer demands that. We pay taxes too and we demand it. Our communities demand it. We can't continue to live with the legacy of policy failure. We've seen that. There is a deep suspicion of government too, because governments are those who took our children. Governments are those who told us where we could live and who we could marry. Many Aboriginal people want less government in their lives, not more. We're entrepreneurial people. We're innovative people. We found ways to put food on the table. We found ways to go out and raise our children. We have ways of being able to survive this. We're resilient people. But if we're seriously going to be able to deal with the gap that still exists in this country, we have to acknowledge the role that history plays in this. And we have to start listening to people. You know, the Prime Minister said this at the Closing the Gap speech recently, that we need to listen. We need to be able to hear what Indigenous peoples are saying. How different communities have different desires and different needs and different ambitions and aspirations. How do we keep kids in school? How do we meet the needs of remote communities and the challenges of service delivery to those communities without shutting them down or tearing them apart? How do we keep children safe without stealing them again from their families? How do we heal the wound that exists in Australia still? It's not just a matter of money. If it was a matter of money, we would have fixed it. We know that. So it's not just where money is spent, it is how it is spent, it is how we listen to people, it is how we respond to this. But it begins as well with that acknowledgement that there is a deep, deep wound, it is raw, it is fresh, and we can touch it and feel it still within us and within our families. If we can't deal with that, then we're nowhere. So the people in the room who deal with these issues of, of policy, who are looking for the solutions, as strange a term as that is, and we know that there is no one solution. We know that there are solutions, many and many have been tried, many have failed. We can't afford another Prime Minister to leave office and say that his greatest regret is that he didn't do enough for Indigenous people. I heard that from Bob Hawke and Paul Keating and Kevin Rudd and Tony Abbott. If Malcolm Turnbull leaves and says, my biggest regret is we didn't do more for Aboriginal people, we know we will have failed another generation and the wound will still sit there. These are the challenges that you all face and these are the challenges that we face. How do we make a difference? We know that we need to get more people into parliament. We know that we need to be at the coalface of where decisions are made. We need to prise open the political parties to get greater representation. We need greater representation at significant and senior levels within the bureaucracy. And we need to have those channels of communication between our peoples and our parliaments and our, and our bureaucracies. And these are the challenges that we all face still today. But it begins with the thing that I talk about in the book, with the thing that was that wound that was torn open once again. And we saw what happened with Adam Goods last year. 
and the question that we still ask ourselves still in Australia today, who are we? What type of nation are we going to be? And how, in a country as demonstrably successful as Australia is, do we still fail the First Peoples? Thank you.